Uh, welcome, everybody. This is the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee conference call. Uh, everybody is welcome to attend this call and participate respectfully with the other participants here. Uh, we have a few announcements on the agenda that maybe I'll, uh, I'll let uh, Rye run through those. Uh, a quarterly report that we should have all read by this point, uh, and then uh, um, a more substantive topic on uh, the uh, graduation process, along with some other discussion topics there, it looks like. So, Rye, if you wouldn't mind reminding us of, of the announcements Happy there. Alone, huh? Oh, please. Thanks. <clears throat> so, in regards to the announcements, the Contributor Summit, we're still trying to figure out location dates for August 1st and 2nd. It was recommended that we do the 1st and 2nd instead of the two days before because that's a Sunday, Monday, and for people traveling, it's probably easier for us to do a Thursday, Friday. So, those are the days that we're looking for now. Um, uh, the uh, Global Forum was approved by the Governing Board. So we're going to be moving forward in regards to looking for the locations for Q1 for 2020. Also, the CFP for Member Summit is going to go out this week for proposals for in Japan. And we're going to be doing the quilt reboot again next week. So um, let me know if you're wanting to participate in that. So oh. if I may ask about the Contributor Summit, I understand you have a location. Do we have a general area, like a continent? Oh, for the contributors, the, the people were asking that I have something done in conjunction with the Member Summit in Japan. Ah, yes. And that's why it's still pending on location right now, is because okay, we're okay. talking to some other people about possible free locations. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm with you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item we have is the Explorer, and I think we've decided to do these reviews offline and then uh, bring forward any uh, issues that need to be raised into this call. Uh, I've reviewed the couple comments around that page. I don't see anything that was requiring further discussion, but uh, we can take a minute here if somebody else had uh, some issue to raise with the Hyperledger Explorer quarterly report. Okay, not hearing any. Uh, next item is the internship proposal selection results. That's me, Dan. All right. Or, um, so Min and I have been um, organizing the internship stuff so far. Actually, Min's been doing most of it. I've just been along for the ride to help her out. Um, we put together the list of proposals last week, put out a survey monkey. Um, called for volunteers who wanted to be part of the survey, or sorry, the selection committee. There were 15 volunteers. I have received 14 responses on the survey monkey. I have provided you a link there um, to the results. The um, problem is, is that we have 12 clear winners and then we have five ties for the last three spots. So we need to pick three. And I have highlighted three here with some a couple of asterisks, which I recommend based on the other hype, other internship projects we have um, already selected. And the reason I highlighted these is they um, the ones that I did not highlight like is is more important here. So the scaling real world HLF deployments. Um, there's actually another. Um, there's another one that got selected. That's the Hyperledger. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, there's another internship, uh, the Umbra one, that got selected that was about simulating Hyperledger blockchains using Mininet, which is also a scaling internship. So we already have a scaling internship. Um, and then the other one, the Raspberry Pi Indie Agent, um, I just don't know that that is something that um, directly applies to... I don't know, the direction of 
Indy. It was a proposal that came in. I, it just doesn't fit well with the, the other theme of the other internships. So anyway, I've highlighted three here that I recommend, um, but I'm going to put it to the TSC to pick three of them. If we can't decide in the next couple minutes, then I'll do another survey monkey and then we'll have this afternoon to all vote independently or tomorrow. But we need to choose three like as soon as possible um, because we plan on launching the application process on Monday. So comments, discussion? I would, I would propose we accept the, the three that you, you suggested and let's have a discussion on it. Anyone disagree with that? Excuse me, where, where is the result? I cannot see the page. Refresh the agenda page and I put a link okay. in there that takes you to the SurveyMonkey results. I also okay. posted that in the TSC channel on Rocket Chat. Thanks, Ray. Um, Dan, are you in control of screen share? No, I am. What do you want to see? Could you put the agenda up like we were doing previously? So that they can actually, so what I normally do is I scroll through the agenda itself so that people can see what it is that he's talking about. Do you see it? Yes. See it. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Sorry I'm for dropping this all on you guys at the last minute. I probably should have sent it to the list this morning to give you guys a chance to read it ahead of time. Um, in the interest of not taking up time here, uh, we can take this to the mailing list. I propose that to all of you. Um, yeah, just a, one, well, one other thought is it seems like the people who are volunteering to mentor, um, uh, I would think that they would have the more informed say of what they're capable of mentoring. Okay. All right. So that settles it. Let's uh, let's keep going and we'll take this to the mailing list, but just be advised, like keep an eye on it because we have to make a decision tonight, basically, and tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. All right. Into the e Roja discussion. We've got I don't know, actually two or three different facets here. One is specifically about uh, whether Iroha should proceed to a first production release it's supported by Hyperledger. Um, and then the second and third are things that uh, were sort of spawned by that question. Uh, we've got the, the need to, to more formalize what that release criteria could or should be in general across the projects and then uh, a question of project life cycle and uh, whether we want to uh, or maybe already do have the capability of uh, moving projects backward as well as forward in that life cycle and whether uh, the position in that life cycle is also one of these formal criteria for, uh, for a full production release. We have had some good discussion on the mail list and I appreciate people taking the time to you know, get their thoughts organized and put into in the mail on the list. I think that gives everybody a better shot at a, at a structured conversation here. Um, sort of my last two cents thrown into that to, to kick off some discussion here is I think that when we think about what it means for Hyperledger to announce a release, in my mind, is not a purely technical readiness question. It's also, you know, this is a statement that Hyperledger is making about backing the readiness of, of the project and what should that entail. And in my mind, that should also entail the, the community readiness behind the project. And that in general, uh, we want all of our projects to be multi-stakeholder projects, multi-vendor projects, so that we don't have the issues that are incumbent with uh, single vendor uh, projects. So I think, you know, there's been a lot of posting, but I have to say, you know, 
I, I'm not completely sure what we want to focus on. I think we need to kind of, you know, separate the different issues we are facing. There is obviously the specific case of Firoa, which has triggered the discussion. But out of this, you know, we several things came up, and and it's been difficult for me to follow the thread and try to figure out where to post what I wanted to say because it seemed like when was somebody was trying to start a thread on one specific issue, then it would split into something else, and and it was a little bit all over the map. So. I, you know, I had taken the uh, action to try to to express in writing what I had tried to say or started touching on during the call last week. But you know, Dave posted stuff that I thought was similar to what I had meant, and so it wasn't clear how much it would be worth doing. You know, in addition to this, and um, and so I, you know, in the end, I figured, okay. I, hopefully, when we are all on the call, we can all get on the same page as to, you know, at least how we want to approach this problem. And, and I mean, when I say this problem in general, because as I said, there are several issues, and I think we first need to agree on the issues, and then decide on the on the process and how, you know, the order in which we want to to approach them. And I hate to make it, you know, more formal than it used to be, but I I really felt the discussion was a little bit all over the map and I don't think we can make progress in that way. Hey, Arno. Yes. After reading through that long discussion that we had all last week, I think it kind of boils down to, in my mind anyway, one question, which is, would the TSC prevent a project from releasing a 1.0 if their community was not fully ready in some way, like their diversity of contributors was not up to snuff or, you know, did they not have a, some documentation or whatever that's community related, right? They haven't had a meetup or anything like that. Would, would the TSC prevent a 1.0 release if their community wasn't in line? So, and, and even though this, and with the assumption that the software has gone through all of the technical reviews, all of the security reviews, it's solid, there are pilot projects, right? That kind of stuff as well. Considering that, would, would you still prevent it? Yeah, but I, I don't think that's even a question for, per se because we already had that discussion and it's actually written in the lifecycle document where if you look at the definition of the first major release, it actually says that, you know, the expectation is that this comes after a project being active, but we might consider cases where, you know, it is not the case. And so we've already discussed this and already anticipated that in some cases we may go to a one zero release, even for a project that is in incubation. So I don't know that we want to reopen that yet. You know, clearly there are people who've expressed the desire to have that you know, be more like enforced than, than we have agreed to uh, in the past. It seems. Yeah, I, my two cents, no. guys. I would add one question. So does TSC think that the diversity will increase if Europa stays in, you know, in the uh, not first final release? So if you don't approve the first final release, <clears throat> and then you ask us to fulfill the requirements to increase the, the diversity, do you think this, by, by not approving it, this will help increase the diversity? I'm not sure that's the right question to ask. I, I think, you know, that's Hold like saying, well, you, ha you have to make us, 1.0 so we can increase diversity, which I don't necessarily agree is the right way to go. But I am asking uh, th that question because we are talking with a number of companies and, uh, you know, we heard uh, that they are struggling with their management to assign, and those are big companies basically, to assign resources to the project that is not mature enough. And by TSC saying we want to proceed with version 1.0, the, you know, the Europa gets, as uh, David said before, this recognition that it's technically sound. And then those companies will 
be able to convince their management that they should assign resources and start contributing to the project. So that's one part of the coin. Uh, of course, we can maybe uh, hear the other part of the coin from your side. I, 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 I'm all in favor for increasing the amount of people working on projects, ideally through different, you know, different companies and all. My question is really, you know, what do we, is this, do we expect this to be enterprise, any project to be enterprise class software? Or is it just open source, do with it what you want? Uh, my official recommendation on Aroha is that it's ready for 1.0. Technically, they have done the CII badge. They've got all the pieces into place. We've secured, we've done a security audit and they have addressed issues and they have met the bar that all of the other projects have met to be 1.0. Now the question is about community, but you know, to address Alish's concern, I think, you know, I, I think that this software is ready for use. And I think it's useful to consider the fact that there are companies that would increase diversity that are waiting on the 1.0 designation. Right, but are they, are they ready to support, you know, issues that come up now that they go to 1.0? Because I agree, people won't use something necessarily till you get production release. Right. Um, something that we have seen some companies do is they want to be part of that release announcement. And so at this point, we start to get a little bit more into the marketing committee's turf. But just as far as helping to influence those companies to become uh, an integrated part of your community, um, being able to participate in the release announcement is something that many of them uh, see advantage in. So having those contributions in so that they can be part of that announcement uh, is a way that we can satisfy both uh, both goals here. And I, I see Vipin's got his virtual hand raised. Uh, Vipin, if you have a few thoughts. Yeah, a couple. Um, one is, how do you measure this? Uh, maybe the thing to do is to go back to the principles, which is basically, if a company pulls out, will the project survive? Uh, that measure is based on the knowledge of the core components, contribution to the core components by the companies, the vendors. In this case, we see we have two projects that are TIFF and 1.0, which is, uh, which is uh, Fabric and Sawtooth. So we got to uh, go back and see what are the real contribution diversity, contribution diversity that will help the project go along. Let's say fabric for, for a, uh, you know, a thought experiment. If IBM pulled out, will fabric continue? If uh, Intel pulled out, will sawtooth continue? So to that, to that end, I, I say that we have to, you know, instead of just uh, talking about diversity and community, uh, these are practical things uh, so that the project actually has a life beyond its, uh, beyond meters themselves. This um, uh, measurement has to be done. I, unfortunately, I haven't had the time to narrow down such a measurement. My measurement would consist of uh, the core contributors at the time when the company, when the project went 1.0 in the core components and also putting in another criteria that is not only the company, the vendor, but all the people that the vendor are paying uh, in, and directly or indirectly. So the investment by the vendor, is that what is propping up the project or not? This was the me metric I was after because I feel that, you know, there's a lot of ink spilled on this about unity, diversity, and so on. But the core question is, will the project continue? I think uh, maturity-wise, when the projects go towards maturity, then there's a chance that the project will continue even if the vendor uh, pulls out. 
In fact, if you look at any of those full projects, you will see contributor diversity to the core components is very limited. Ethereum has probably 10 or 15, Bitcoin, less than 10 guys, uh, you know, which are contributing the core components. I'm not talking about level two and other things or, or, or ops stuff. Uh, Linux started out that way with five or 10 guys. So are we chasing after something that is not possible to measure uh, at this point in time? And if you use a tool like GitDM and get all of the contributors, and even you know, if you take people who have contributed documentation, other scripts and other things, they're not going to sustain the project if it really goes into 1.0 has serious difficulties. Anyway, this is my thesis and I, I don't have the data to prove this, but. All right, thank you, Vipin. Uh, Silas, I saw your hand next. Um, yeah, I, I think um, some of what we've said there is, is kind of interesting, like the, the sort of who is the beneficial owner of contributors, but that's perhaps another discussion. Um, so I think there is something slightly problematic about coupling community health, which I do think is a good idea to try and represent, and it, and it does light a bit of a fire to try and get genuine maintainer diversity, but linking that to, to software and project maturity, I mean, so the, the ability of a project to carry on is an important thing, but if you look at, you know, no one would say, for example, SQLite is a uh, not mature piece of software, but it's overwhelmingly be written by one person, by Richard Hip. Um, it, it, it's clear that these are actually different concepts. And in fact, I mean, in the case of Golang, like with the new module system, it literally breaks that. Like the fact that we have to use 1.0 to signal something about community that isn't directly related to the software. Now they're, they're quite correlated. So like in the case of Burrow right now, for example, it's not such a big problem. I, I, I don't think we're ready for our 1.0 release and nor is our community. But it, it is entirely possible for a, a group of dedicated core maintainers to, um, uh, you know, to have a low bus factor, but have a highly mature product. Um, and I don't know whether there should be something around, you know, this is community incubation, but you can go 1.0. Um, they are, they are of course related, you know, a very successful project that has a, a, a benevolent dictator is quite likely to get picked up in a way that, that something that's less mature and has less intrinsic value is, is less likely to. So they're not completely independent, but I do think there's something problematic with, with firmly linking community health with, software quality, software maturity. All right, thanks Silas. Hart? Yeah, so I have a couple of comments on this. Um, first of all, I want to ask, what are the specific benefits from going from incubation status to active status? Uh, because I don't really know of anything off the top of my head other than some, uh, some marketing stuff. Um, secondly, I'm very interested in getting a formalization of both the incubation to uh, active, even though we already have a document, it seems like there's a lot of discussion around this, and a 1.0 because, well, hopefully, you know, hopefully we will be doing these things uh, in URSA, maybe in not the, the near future, but you know, at some point, and it would be nice to have a sort of consistent uh, documentation and guidelines around these. Uh, and as far as the diversity goes, I think this kind of thing is going to be very difficult to measure uh, properly. Like, what if we all just go off and make every commit with a fresh Linux Foundation account, right? Um, I think if we want to if we want to measure this somehow, it, it it's going to be very difficult, um, and and it's not really clear what what we should do if we want to have diversity requirements. Okay, thank you, uh, Ben. Yeah, I, I have a couple of points, um, and 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 really uh, play back on Vipin's uh, point earlier. Um, is that contributors to an open source project is very, very dynamic. Um, today we might have diversity, tomorrow we might not. 
Um, so at this point, it seemed to me from Iroha point of view, uh, from the technical point of view, Iroha uh, is a good candidate for, for one now. I think nobody is arguing about the, the technical maturity of, of the project. Uh, from the community, because of that, we need to consider the dynamicity of the contributors uh, comes and go. But the, my second point, I think is more important, is that the supporting vendors, in this case, perhaps only one, but we have to look at this vendor's uh, significant con contribution to this project and also what reasons that they might likely to go away. And, and I think it's unlikely that that uh, they would go away. Uh, it's the same uh, when I looked at fabric, for example, you know, at, at one O level, uh, majority of the code uh, contributors came from IBM. Uh, from other companies, there are a couple of other companies, but very insignificant. I would say that less than 0.5% of the number of lines of code, right? But the actual line of code. So, you know, but would IBM go away? It's very unlikely because IBM built a whole business, a whole division on this, right? Uh, so we, I think we have to look further than that, rather than just the number of vendors that are currently contributing to a project today, because that number might disappear tomorrow. And the same in the case of Aroha, when we voted it to be from incubator to, to active status, it was more contributors than just one vendor, but today it's not, right? So, so I think we have to look into that rather than just the number today versus, the, versus it's yesterday or tomorrow. Thank you, yeah. Uh, I wanna get uh, a couple other comments that are waiting out there too, but yeah, I, I don't think that we will necessarily be able to get to a fully objective measurement, but there's also a difference between having <coughs> something that, that you can kind of squint at and say, all right, well, there's, there's more than one viewpoint expressed in this community and uh, the opposite that it's just really exclusively a, a single company participating. So uh, uh, Bawa, and then uh, we'll get to uh, Nikolai after that, and then uh, Mark, go ahead, Bawa. Yeah, I, my point is uh, we need to separate the technical quality from the ecosystem quality. So you know for uh, open, system, open source uh, project, it's always more difficult to build a mature ecosystem. So as the uh, open source community, I'd like to suggest that we um, keep more friendly to all the contributors and to encourage the, those guys to contribute more. So for the one portal, I, I would suggest we focus most, mostly on the technical points, like the code quality. While we can still add more criteria for the, uh, the status, like we can uh, measure the diversity or something else from the status if the project want to become uh, active. So yeah, that's my point. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Nikolai. Thanks, Stan. Uh, I'd like to double the points you've been. So diversity is a very dynamic thing and it is obvious for us as for maintainers of Oroha that uh, we've, we see, we observe right now positive trends in uh, the activities like rocket chat, uh, more people pull our Docker images, Questions are asked uh, on Stack Overflow and more and more people contribute to our documentation. However, code contributions to the code base were, you know, always this part where people like from outside were not contributing a lot. So we tried to improve this with our diversity plan and some of the actions that were made, uh, that were written in the plan are, are already in effect and we see that uh, it gives us positive things like Contributors come and help us with some libraries that were stale, for example, scale library. Um, given that, and the thing that diversity is a dynamic, uh, dynamic kind of substance thing, yeah, it, it would be really nice to separate the term technical maturity and community health. 
And community health can be a dynamically absorbed measure, um, combining several things like number of commits for that period of time from several vendors, or uh, I don't know, number of people participating in the, uh, like um, Stack Overflow answers and so on. Because uh, it's really hard to say whether, um, it's really hard to, to say that we are really not diverse because we have diversity of people um, like with this client libraries and contributions to documentation and many other things. But at the same time, core co code contributions are limited to one group. And hopefully this will change because as Alex has just said that we have some um, letter of intents that are oral. Hopefully there will be documents uh, with some of the companies and um, some of the companies that don't, don't, cannot make this letter of intent. They say that the biggest impediment is that we really need to be a production ready solution. If we go back to incubation, people will think that there is still some work to be hatched and they still associate, um, you know, technical maturity with this status as Hart has, as Hart noticed in, I think in the list, there was a message from Hart that, um, People will have a wrong perception of Roja as a tool that is not yet production ready. So my proposal is to make a decision on the first major release, considering its state from a technical point of view. And in parallel, launch a discussion related to lifecycle grooming. Should we separate the states? Should we uh, put Roja bed in, back in incubation? And uh, what an outcome it will, uh, it will perform on the community and uh, on potential vendors that uh, would contribute or would not contribute to the project. That's my message. I'm sorry, can, can you actually repeat for me? Um, right. The, uh, were you suggesting that it would be okay to move forward with a 1.0 and simultaneously regress to incubation, that that would not harm your project? No, it's um, a wrong interpretation. I, th I say that in parallel, we should launch a discussion related to life cycle grooming and separation of states for uh, community health ath assessment and technical state of the project. Because in my opinion, incubation right now as a word implies um, things that can be percepted in a wrong way that uh, the project itself is not technically mature and people like the vendors, or potential users, contributors, will think that incubation is something that is linked to a technical state. So as now we have this, you know, um, uh, well, life cycle thing, um, th this life cycle states, they combine uh, both technical and um, community maturity uh, uh, kind of states. And my idea is maybe we should separate them and make it visible so that, well, let's say first major release is a huge technical achievement, but in terms of community, uh, we have not the, not, the very, not the very best weather in one of the projects, however, I mean, sub-projects, or let's call it the core uh, Iroha code. Because with our client libraries, things are better than... Um, than with the core code. However, we still need to operate with some metrics and I'm really um, curious if we are going to operate with any of them. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Mark, your virtual arm must be very tired. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, yes. Um, so I was gonna say, let's just at this point, you know, we're trying to hold them to a standard that we're trying to define on the fly. Let's just go figure out, you know, let's vote on a Rohar based on the quote unquote standards that were in place when they, when they applied for this. And it looks, you know, that there's a lot more discussion that the TSE has to have on some of these issues, but let's not hold up a Rohar for that. You know, they're sort of being held against their will and it's not going to help them to hold them up, I don't think. I plus one that. So just on a separate note on that, Dave, what's your take on the DCO situation? That was my 
more concrete question for you. Sorry, I was uh, muted. Um, okay, yeah, so I did a DCO that last week. Um, I created the unique set of contributors for Roja, worked with Makoto-san to get Sormitsu developers moved out of that list because they can be covered by a single sign-off for Sormitsu as employees. Um, we're down to, I think I sent the link out to you guys, the spreadsheet I built. Um, I don't have it in front of me right now, but I think we had like 27 separate contributors who had landed change sets that did not sign off. So um, they were not Sormitsu employees. So that, that's a pretty significant number. I think there should be some effort to try to track them down um, and get them to sign off. But if we can't, then we'll have to squash commit at least, at least up to the point to the most recent change set by somebody we can't find. Or we'll have to get a, or get an exception or whatever. Maybe Rai can comment on that, like the remediation of this. But I know exactly who has contributed that we should try to find. So just to be clear, I plus one the approval for one zero subject to the to the DCO issue being addressed. Um, the code looks good. Uh, looks like uh, Nikolai, uh, you have more to say. Yes. So, um, Go ahead. I remember in 2017 we used to have a process um, given by CLA Hub tool, and this tool was used to prove that your code is signed off by you just like for the very first tool request. Is actually here with us uh, during the call, so he can give more details. But the thing is, uh, only later in early 2018, I recall that our our uh, con continuous integration pipeline has been changed, and um, this included this new DCO vote, and this also imposed the new requirement for minus s git option for sign offs. So my question is, uh, in Hyperledger Charter section 13 this said that there is a an approved contribution process by hyperledger governing board and the linux foundation and there is a sign off process that should be defined but i'm not able to find any document or decision where this thought which sign off process is exactly approved so if there's anyone who can help with this issue and uh, tell us exactly where we uh, violated the rule because in my opinion if CLA hub is um, compliant with these requirements we have no DCO issue at all. Uh, Nikolai I don't think you guys violated the rules um, because I think I don't know for sure but I can go back and, and confirm this I think those contributions by people who are not Sormitsu employees that didn't do the dash s sign off um, happened prior to the Aroha code base coming into Hyperledger. But Aroha code base is like from 2016. And uh, I think that the very first commits were made by Saramitsu employees, so we should have no problem. And the rest of that um, is our contributors. Like those 26 people you told that are non-conformant with sign-offs, it doesn't make any sense to me. So can you please revisit the charter and investigate the situation more. If needed, I can cooperate with Solana and with Sara and we can find out a solution. Because right now the situation is not really clear whether we have something that is not conformant with the charter or 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 it's conformant. I mean we should figure this Nikolai, out. are you asking whether the whether the squash commit Hap, you know, and the sign of DCO stuff happened after all those 27 people contributed. Otherwise, I mean, basically the rule was put in place later than the uh, commits by those 27 people. Okay, that makes sense to me. But still, we don't want to modify history in terms of individual commits. The authors will remain, the committers possibly change because we need to change the commit. 
in order to add the sign off. It's really crucial not to make any squash because in that case, people won't be able to see who modified the code base uh, in a particular file. So we'll, if there is a modification required, we will modify a commit, but uh, we will not make a squash commit. Uh, a decision by the team. Yeah, I, I'm a little confused how, uh, how a squash commit fits the underlying IP issues. So I don't know yeah, why you're it. <laughs> I always interpreted that as meaning, well, whoever does the squash basically takes liability for everything that has happened before. <laughs> right. Seriously. Right. So prior to uh, Hyperledger, uh, all projects that came into LF were required to come in with a squash commit. Hyperledger mm -hmm. is uh, exceptional in that way. Uh, and when years ago, when CLA Hub was in effect, if I recall, and I apologize, I don't remember exactly the, the text of the CLA Hub that people were signing off on was not, it was a modified version of the DCO. So why was CLA Hub turned off? As I recall, it was because the DCO text that was on CLA Hub was not the DCO text that we use that the Linux Foundation uses. So that's the why of that. And you can't, uh, and I think this is good, you can't go back and change that text retroactively, right? Because that would change history as to what you have signed off on. So that, that was why, as I recall. So is it possible that uh, we contact these uh, uh, developers without a DCO and uh, ask for some acknowledge? Yeah, that's what I was proposing. Yeah. Can you say that again? What are you proposing? I mean, we uh, like to send an email to these uh, contributors without uh, the sign off and uh, ask whether they would like to give some sign of uh, email again. Yeah, of course, if they answer, that's the, the easy way out. Right, yeah. and I think some number of them will probably say, yeah, sure, yeah, whatever. But then the, we get down to just a few that we have to make exceptions for. Yeah, it's not a huge number. Well, we, we need to make that first step to find out. <laughs> right. That's why I compiled that spreadsheet. We have all the email list, the emails they use when contributing to the project. And that's where we should start. My recommendation, anyway. Because quite frankly, if we had an email from all of these people saying, yeah, it's fine, I, you know, I don't think Eroa necessarily has to go through that excruciating pain of going and changing all the commits, as long as we have a reference somewhere that say, no, it's covered. You could even like, I don't know, check the emails in, right? To yeah. Eroa code base. That's what I was saying to say. It's like, yeah, something like that. I mean, oh, put a link to the archive or something. You, you my, in my opinion, I guess, uh, the need for the sign off is only to avoid the legal risk, right? If we get the email, that should be okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, agreed. Okay. So, are, oh, can you hear me? Does the DCO apply to specific project by project, or is it a global thing? In other words, if some of these people already have a DCO in place with Linux Foundation, would that apply? DCO is per commit. Per commit, okay. That's my That's the problem. Right. So now we have a bunch of commits that aren't, that don't have the assertion, so now what? Right, okay. and the, we, the way they got in there was we didn't have the infrastructure in place, or they weren't on Hyperledger infrastructure when those commits were made, but now you can't make a commit without signing off in any of our projects. 
regardless, this does mean rewriting the entire history then from those commits that need to be changed. I mean, even if they don't get squashed, even if they get a sign off added, it's going to change the hash. N not if we can get emails from them. Okay, emails are good. Okay. Okay. There, there so, just so has I, to be some. I, I there just the, has to be some form of DCO that's in there, whether it's the email or the sign off. I mean, you still have to make sure I, I, but but I thought the email from from Nikolai is that those commits follow the previous procedure, something for TLA. So, uh, could could we just dig up that procedure and say say those commits that, uh, are covered? I think we we need try to solve this uh, in such detail on this call, but uh, can I have an owner from um, Salona or, or her team to make sure that we are in a healthy sign-off state? I'll take it. Well, yeah, I'll take it. I might ask Riot for a little help, but yeah, I've already done most of the work so far. Would it be out of order to ask uh, for, you know, a vote of 1.0 readiness, you know, conditional on the DCO sign-off so that we have a concrete target for the Aroha team and they know that next week or the week after, if they can get the DCO stuff worked out, it's purely mechanical. They don't need to come back and have another round of argumentation or is that out of order? That could certainly be within order if, um, if the TSC members feel like they've heard all the information that, that they need to make a decision. I get uh, some sort of I'm, quick I'm, sign from people if they're ready. I'm yeah, comfortable I, with that. I'm comfortable. Yeah, we will solve the DCO problem sooner or later. So the proposal would be that we accept Aroha going to 1.0 based on DCO resolution. Uh, it came in a little choppy for me, but yeah, I'll just restate what I think you said that we will momentarily here take a vote on uh, enabling Hiroha to make a first major release pursuant to clearing their uh, DCO history. Clearing we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna fix any definitional issues with incubation later? Are we, are we making precedent here or? Well, uh, yeah, I guess one other comment that I was gonna make either is and now or as part of my vote is that uh, I would be willing to uh, take a, a degree of freedom, let's say, with what we choose to do for Eroha here based on their long history with, with Hyperledger. Uh, but if we were to get, say, a new project from a new company that was entirely and exclusively from that one company, um, it would be very important to me that that they go to the required effort to grow a more diverse basis for that project. Um, <clears throat> let me state that one of the things that I'm working on right now is for us to get all this vocabulary ironed out more clearly between both the TSC and the marketing team and all of the different projects so that we can have clear defined metrics as to what is you know, vendor diversity, what are the community health, what does all of that actually look like? And once we get those things properly defined, then it becomes easier to do the enforcement aspects of it because it becomes more of a automated process versus a discussion. Um, so Silas, I'm not too worried about the whole previous precedent if we do create these materials and then have both committees vote on them sounds fine to me then and um, yeah I think the code looks good too so I'd vote for one because we certainly don't want to do this to you Silas <laughs> when you go to 1.0 uh, yeah we, we need to take a look at some of our early DCO stuff uh, anyway. <laughs> okay so uh, quickly then before we move into the vote we'll have one or two further topics for uh, the next time we meet one is clearly on the uh, 1.0 release criteria and uh, do we, Arno, have a second separate topic on moving from active to incubation for projects, or do you feel like that's uh, not an issue? So interesting enough, the project lifecycle talks about possible multiple iteration, and so there is a already door open for, you know, the finger point, I mean, the, the, the you know, moving up and down that uh, uh, 
that route. And so I think it's more to do with what I would be interested in, in defining clear criteria for major release. I think, you know, uh, we had uh, Fabric, Chris sent out uh, what was used. That was the sole choice of the maintainers. Iroa, Nikolai sent uh, an email a few weeks ago where, you know, he described some things that he felt were relevant. But if you compare the two, they are quite different lists. And I think it would be useful to have a list of criteria that we would expect people to at least address as part of the request to move to a major release. And that's independent from whether, you know, a product is active or in incubation. I think the, you know, my, my position on the question at hand is, I think if it were today, IROA would not qualify to be in active status based on the current definition and exit criteria from incubation. At the same time, I think we would support the first major release on that, you know, basis on the basis we have in the document that says well sometimes we might accept that even for any uh, project in incubation so irrelevant of whether iroa still qualifies to be in active status or not i think even if they were in incubation today we might be inclined to say yeah technically the project is you know um, mature enough to qualify for one or release Okay, thank you. So uh, next time then we'll focus exclusively on the release criteria question. And that should leave us just enough time then today uh, if uh, we can do a roll vote. Rye, I don't know if that's you or uh, Salona. That would be Salona. Salona, would you like to take us through a roll vote, please? And you are on mute if you are attempting to speak. Okay, well. Uh... Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so first of all, um, so I guess Dan is initiating the vote. So that means who is going to be the second? I'll second. And all four? Yay. Yay. Aye. Yes. Yes. Aye. Aye. All right. And um, those abstaining? And those opposed? All righty then, I guess it so moves forward. All right. Congratulations, Congratulations guys. Iroha team. Congratulations. Congratulations. Not that easy. Congrats. <laughs> 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 the gauntlet. Useful test. Hopefully, it's all the sweeter for the uh, extra effort. I can get a night of sleep. <laughs> okay. Um, as we wrap up here, then I think we are off next week. Let me check me on that. Why would we be off? Uh, I feel like there is some event. Quite remember there's no plan uh, to cancel that no we actually have some big topics coming up next week um the biggest one being test nets and the ci cd stuff that dave hughesby's been working on i'm also going to be talking i hope at that point i'll have all the information i need to talk about the ambassador reboot because we're doing some technological stuff in the back end to enable that which might help our numbers a little that we were just talking about um <clears throat> so i i hope we're not um, if you do need someone else to run it, then let, let us know so that we can get someone else in place to run it. Okay, well, we'll, we'll handle the uh, phone process offline then. Um, but as usual, the, the more that we can organize conversations over uh, the mail list and so forth, uh, the better prepared we'll be whether or not we're speaking live next week. Yeah, D Dave's already planning on posting some of that information about the test nets in CICD. And for me, like I said, I'm waiting on a meeting to happen. And then I can start posting the stuff about the ambassadors program. Okay. Yep. My report's coming together. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And congratulations again to the uh, Iroha team. Thanks, everybody. Guys, bye. Bye.